Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Dr. Madeleine Muller here, and we are broadcasting live from the Family Medicine Boardroom um, here at Cecilia Makiwani Hospital in Mtansane. Um, and I'm very pleased today to be presenting the brand new National Department of Health Vertical Transmission Prevention of Communicable Diseases Guideline. Um, and we used to know these as the PMTCT guideline. Um, but I think PMTCT is so strongly linked in our minds to HIV that they, we are now using the term vertical transmission and we're thinking much wider than just HIV. So we're actually going to be covering HIV today as well as hepatitis B, syphilis um, and TB. Um, and because of that, it's going to be tight. So I'm going to be going quite fast. Uh, what I'm hoping today is just to inspire you to go and read the guidelines and to become aware of what's new and some of the finer nuances um, in that guideline. Right, so our four pillars of vertical transmission is still what we're very familiar with, starting right at the beginning of the primary prevention of transmittable diseases, so actually preventing HIV in the first place, and um, preventing unintended pregnancies in our ladies, then once the lady is pregnant, preventing transmission, and then providing proper care um, after delivery of the, the children and the family of that person. And I'm not going to spend, I've got one slide literally on the prevention side, and um, it's just to remind us that we still need to continue with our, our prevention packages is still our most important um, aspect of prevention. If a woman is already been diagnosed with HIV and virally suppressed by the time she falls pregnant, um, we do not have to worry. And so being able to already be very aware of our sexually productive clients and making sure they've got all the packages in place is very important. Um, in terms of HIV prevention, a reminder on U equals U. So undetectable means untransmissible. And we really need to get that message out there. And this becomes particularly important for couples that are trying to fall pregnant. So if you've got somebody who's planning to have a baby um, and who's got HIV or the partner's HIV, that one can put a focus on that and that they will be able to, um, to conceive safely. Um, and then not to forget PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis. So PrEP is completely safe in pregnancy. Can I repeat that? Completely safe. And remember, our pregnant women are definitely having sex and they're definitely having unprotected sex. That's why they're pregnant. Um, and therefore, this is actually one of our key, key, key populations where we have to look at risk and offer PrEP. And that should happen within the antenatal clinic throughout pregnancy for our HIV negative women um, and still involving our partners, for example, with our, our medical male circumcisions. And then just in terms of contraception, just to remember that Dolly Tegover is safe with all of the contraceptions. We still have, we had a little bit of issues with efavirenz, and we have some issues with rifampicin, for example, with the implanon. But actually with the, with the new ARV regimens, we do not have to worry about the contraception that we are prescribing and we can give women the full range um, of options. But let's start getting into the bulk of it. And, and we're going to spend quite a bit of time looking at antenatal care. Um, and we'll start off with pregnancy because that's always the one that um, is certainly the most prevalent um, still in our pregnant populations. Um, and there's two major strategies um, when we are looking at preventing our babies from getting HIV. And the most important of that is, is your maternal viral suppression. If, you're, if, you're, if your viral load is suppressed in the mom, your baby is not um, going to get ill. Um, and then secondly, making sure that our babies are covered. And that post-exposure prophylaxis is really to do with after delivery. So the most high risk time when the baby is going to get HIV is actually during delivery. And that six weeks of treatment that we give after delivery is actually a post-exposure prophylaxis to cover for delivery. So we are concerned even with a mom with um, a suppressed viral load in the blood, um, there might still be virus in the genital tract, and we therefore want to make sure that that cover is happening. And if your mother is suppressed and you use, you're using your post-exposure prophylaxis, we, are, uh, we should not be having babies that are getting HIV. If these steps fail, usually due to um, adherence issues with our, with our moms, then there's a huge focus, obviously, on diagnosing our babies early, getting them onto ARVs, um, making sure they're getting breastfed, and making sure they can, they can have a normal growth and development. So in terms of our HIV negative women, so testing, we really need to be very um, vigilant with our testing. 
Um, and remember, if a woman converts during pregnancy, the viral load is very high when you first get HIV. And actually, that's probably the most risky scenario for your baby. So we obviously do an HIV test whenever you uh, diagnose somebody as pregnant and that at every antenatal visit. So that pretty much works out to four weekly. Very important is we, we want to integrate. So you'll see that's a theme throughout the guidelines is that everything happens within the antenatal normal bank visits. Um, so you don't bring in extra visits to try and, and get your four weekly going. Um, and you try and make sure that you, you HIV test at every possible context. And then very important, doesn't matter when the last HIV test was, when she comes into the delivery room, then you do another test at that point. So our main um, prevention for our moms who are pregnant with HIV um, is TLD, of course, um, our lovely combination of tenofovir, lamivudine, and dolitegravir. Um, and I'm going to go very briefly through... Um, through these regimens because they're very well covered in our webinar that we did on the ARV guidelines, but we're going to have a little bit of a pregnant woman focus when we look at that. So just for those of you that might not be aware of the, I haven't even looked at the old guide of the new guidelines yet, we now have this new terms, TLD1 and TLD2. They're exactly the same drugs, same fixed dose combination, but TLD1 is when you start somebody for the first time on ARVs or you switch somebody on a first line regimen. And this is somebody who has never failed uh, a regimen before. TLD2 is for any patient who might have failed a previous regimen. And it might be somebody you switch to as TLD2 as a second line regimen, or you're switching them on an existing second line regimen. And therefore, we must get away from this idea that you can look at the drugs and know which line the patient is on. You're going to have to look at the history of the patient to know is this first line, second line, or third line. And then just a reminder for those of you that has not been aware, there was in 2018 what they call a safety signal, which just means on early evidence, there was a little bit of a concern about dolitegravir and neurodevelopmental um, defects. Since that time, we have much more data available and those studies were actually released. And in the final evidence that's come out, there, there was no statistically significant difference between people um, conceiving on dolitegravir um, versus other ARVs. So we are completely reassured in terms of using TLD, but you might still find moms who have heard about having to be careful with dolitegravir, and therefore you need to be able to explain this well and make sure that we reassure our mommies um, of, that this is completely safe. So in terms of dolitegravir drug interactions, just remember if your mom's also got TB, you also have to, to boost that dolitegravir. But probably the one that affects us the most for our pregnant moms is the supplements that we give. So our pregnant moms usually is on a bit of calcium and a bit of iron. Um, and one of the challenges with the polyvalent cations is that there's interactions between the cations and dolitegravir. And then you have the, the complications of whether you're having it with food or not food. So, to make it simple, I'm just going to simply tell you what to do, and then it's easy to remember. Um, so if the patient is on antacids, and remember lots of our pregnant mommies get a little bit of heartburn, and they need to take the antacids six hours before or two hours after the dolitegravir, so not at the same time. Um, and if they're on their supplements, the easy way to do it is if you're giving them a calcium twice a day dosing, then you want to give the calcium in the morning and in the evenings and ask them to have it with food and with their dolitegravir, whichever time of the day they're taking it. And then they can take their iron at lunch. So iron and calcium is not a good combination either. Um, so calcium in the morning, calcium in the evenings. If you're going to have your TLD, usually in the morning you have it with your calcium, with the food, and then you just have your iron at lunch and you won't run into any trouble. So if we have a newly diagnosed HIV positive woman, the very the most important thing is try and start out at all costs on the same day if possible. So we're doing test and treat anyway, but we're a little bit more relaxed for our non-pregnant patients. But in our pregnant patients, this is an absolute priority is getting that ARVs going. Obviously, if your patient doesn't want to, you can't force them, but you're going to be bringing them back regularly um, to help prepare them and get ready to start. Um, and always our concern is TB. So in a pregnant woman who might have TB symptoms, you want to very actively investigate. But if you do diagnose TB, you always will start the ARVs within two weeks. So we don't use the CD4 rule um, because we want to try and get that baby covered as quickly as possible. We do still have the challenge in moms with TB meningitis or cryptococcal meningitis that we're going to defer the art for four to six weeks. These are very sick, very high risk patients, and they need to be me in expert, expert care. And then all, 
all our women now very nicely, very easily. They're all going to get TLD and they just need to weigh over 30 kilograms. We should hopefully not have many mommies that weighs less than 30 kilograms. Um, and if you do have somebody that have um, potentially renal impairment or you do have somebody that weighs less than 30 kilograms, then we can use our ALD. And that a back of a 3DC dolitegravir is now available. We have it at CMH. I'm not sure if it's a clinic set as a once a day tablet. So that makes it very easy. So you can either give your TLD or your ALD. It's once a day and, and easy. Um, if you're using ALD, though, for renal impairment, you might have to split the dose if you have to reduce the dose of that lamivudine. So very simply, we're going to just quickly run through the stuff you know. If you diagnose somebody pregnant today, you diagnose HIV, you're obviously going to stage them. You're going to remember to put them on Bactrim. So now pregnant women, um, Bactrim is still important if that CD4 is under 200 or they've got a staging. You're obviously going to do your CD4, your creatinine, your urine dipstick, and ooh, your hepatitis B serum antigen. And very important, this has been in the guidelines, um, but I'm not sure if it's always happening, is doing that baseline gene expert in pregnant women. Um, so we are more actively starting to look for asymptomatic TB, even in our non-pregnant patients. But pregnant women are more likely to present with asymptomatic TB. Quite often, they've got so much going on with the pregnancy that you might miss um, key TB symptoms. So you, you need to do a gene expert as part of your screening. Then very important, you start your, lay, your, your woman on the ARVs, you don't wait for the results, bring them back three to seven days later, look out for that CRAD result, so make sure you don't miss it if the CD4 was under 100. Um, and very much important, this has always been the rule with pregnant women, is that if the CRAG is positive, you have to send them for an LP, because a significant percentage of those patients, even with no symptoms, will have some of those scriptococcus in the in the CSF um, and that is risky. Um, if the creatinine is over 85, so remember in pregnant women we don't do calculations. We've got a baby on board, so you can't use your normal weight, weight um, and 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 body calculations. Um, you're obviously going to have to change them to some abacava, 3TC dolitegravir, and these need to be in a in a in a, a higher level of setting referred to an expert. Um, we're managing a woman with pregnancy and kidney problems is a whole nother kettle of fish. Um, and of course, if you've excluded TB, um, I do have another slide where we'll quickly talk around the, the, the TPT that we're going to be using in our pregnant woman, um, our A&H prophylaxis. Just a very quick slide on your very sick woman that might have TB. So there's red flags you want to look out for. So if they're tachypneic and they're struggling to breathe, if they've got fevers and high pulses and low blood pressures, obviously if they're coughing up blood, um, so if they are very ill, we want to very, very quickly, obviously, please refer them. I would admit these patients, a pregnant woman that is sick is very vulnerable. Um, and don't get fooled by that negative gene expert. So if the gene expert's negative, you've got to look further. Uh, just a reminder that our urinary TB lamb, you can do if they're HIV positive and the CD4 is under 200. I know some people are still using that 100 cutoff, but we can use up to 200 for TB symptoms to look if they might be TB that way. You know, pregnant woman, um, even once pregnant, you will do an x-ray, obviously, with all precautionary measures taken, um, but it's more important to actually diagnose that TB. Try and find a sample somewhere um, and send a sputum for culture and LPA to have in your back pocket, but you're not going to be able to wait. And you might have to use things like check what the HP is doing, look at the CRP, see if there might be extra pulmonary TB, your ALP and gamma GT might help for that but you might have to decide early on on empiric treatment um, and have a high index of, of treating uh, due to the very high mortality that we still see in pregnant women due to respiratory infections and especially TB. So in terms of our viral load monitoring, great. So obviously if you've got somebody who's already on art, so the woman's coming, she's already taking her ARVs, you wanna do a viral loaded booking, it doesn't matter when the last viral load is, we want to know what the viral load is doing at the moment. I'm going to switch all your patients to a dolitegravir containing regimen. I'm going to talk us through that in a moment, if possible. Um, and when that viral load comes back, so you don't have to wait for the viral load to do the switch. There's, there's one or two scenarios where you might wait, um, but the majority of them you're going to start. And if the viral load is over 50, you're going to start with that ABCD and your advanced adherence counseling. And I'm not going to cover those factors at the moment. Very important to... Um, to look at your support for your for your pregnant woman. So in terms of switching, so most patients you will see, I'm going to run through the criteria, are going to be switched to TLD. So TLD is our current 
either TLD1 or TLD2, depending on, on, on what they're on. And um, you can see that anybody who's over 10 years and 30 kilograms qualifies for TLD. If for some reason you can't use TLD, then we'll be using ALD. That's usually because of renal problems or if there's a weight issue. Um, and if the abacabur is contraindicated for some reason, so that's more important for our Western Cape colleagues where you might still see abacabur hypersensitivity in our colored and our white patients. Um, but then it's the only scenario where you will use AZT. So please note, we are getting rid of AZT. We're no longer begin going to be seeing AZT in second line regimens. The only times where you might use AZT is in your neonates in the first 30 days, um, but we are slowly getting rid of AZT. And it's partly because of the risk of anemia with AZT, but mostly because of the twice daily dosing. So there's a huge focus on creating easy regimens for patients to be able to take. If there's a weird scenario where you're still using a PI, uh, I can't imagine which scenarios. Our wellness clinic, we've managed to change almost everybody off um, our lipinavir ritonavir, then you will use atazanavir ritonavir as a preferred, um, preferred option. And we're no longer using nevirapine. If you've got anybody on nevirapine, please get them off nevirapine. Um, there's no longer any indications for, for nevirapine. So great. So this is very, very simple. So who can we switch? So firstly, there's those that you can switch, doesn't matter what the viral load is. So those are the patients who come in, pregnant, um, HIV positive, on ARVs. And if they're on, still on an old efavirenz-based regimen, doesn't matter what the efavirenz is combined with, whether it's denofovir or abacavir, or if they're still on a virapine, all of those patients, you can switch to TLD. It doesn't matter how long they've been on that regimen. It doesn't matter what their viral load is doing. Very important, we still have patients on AZT, 3TC, and dolitegravir. So that was the, the, the previous second line before the new guidelines came out. We've only had it for about 18 months or two years. So you won't have anybody who's been on it for longer than two years. And all of those patients, regardless of viral load, you will switch to TLD. Now, the only place where it gets a little bit tricksy is for the patients who are on a lupinavir based regimen at the moment. Um, if they've been on that regimen for less than two years, so it doesn't matter, again, if it's with AZT or Abacava or Tenofovir, the only Pinova Ritonova regimen, you can switch them to TLD. Easy. Okay. So when does it get tricksy? So now you've got somebody, she's pregnant. She's on a lupinavir based regimen. So say she's on AZT, 3TC, lupinavir Ritonova or Atazanavir Ritonova. And she's been on that regimen for the longer than two years. These are the patients where we would want a viral load result before we can switch them to TLD. So you're pregnant woman, you're going to continue them then on this regimen, but you're going to wait for that viral load result. If the viral load comes back and it's less than 50, it's LDL, you can change to TLD too, easy. If the viral load is between 50 and 999, so well, this is what we call a possible low level viremia, then you're gonna repeat your viral load and because they're pregnant, you're gonna repeat it after one month. And if it's still under a thousand, you can switch to TLD too. So also if you look back and you've got two recent viral loads and they were both under 1,000 but over 50, that's a low-level viremia, you can switch to TLD too. Okay. Right. So now it gets a little bit more complicated. So these are the women who's on Lipinova Ritonova, longer than two years, viral load more than 1,000. Again, you're going to repeat your viral load after one month. So you're not going to do the three months like we do with non-pregnant women. Remember, we're in a rush. If the viral load is still over 1,000, we're now going to look at what is the adherence pattern of this mommy to decide whether we can give them TLD or not. If the adherence is less than 80%, we're going to take a small risk. So the concern is always about switching them off lipinavir ritonavir is that maybe they have lost lipinavir ritonavir, they're resistant to lipinavir ritonavir, and we are losing that as a possible um, third-line option if they fail on TLD or if they get resistant to dolitegravir. It's a very small risk because it's very difficult to get resistant to lipinavir ritonavir. Um, but if the adherence is less than 80%, we're going to take that risk because it's more important to give the patient an easy regimen to take. So the priority is going to be, we don't know if that viral load is up because of adherence or because of resistance, but it's going to be better for the patient on the long run to just get onto the easiest regimen possible. So if the adherence is less than 80%, we're going to change to TLD2. It's only if you've got a patient who's been failing for more than two, it's got two viral loads over a thousand, longer than two years on lipinavir, 
adherence more than 80%. So this is the patient where you're thinking, oh, I'm really worried about resistance here that you're going to discuss with an expert um, and talk about genotypes. And you will certainly discuss with those uh, if we might want to change the TLD while we, while we wait for that genotype, even because of the pregnancy. When we're talking about adherence, we're talking about objective value of adherence. So unfortunately, what the patient tells you is not what we use to decide whether we think the patient's adherence. You're going to look at the history in terms of collections um, and refills. Great. So now we've got somebody um, that we've got pregnant. They're on ARVs now, either newly started or switched. Um, and how do we do our violet monitoring? So if you've got a new patient, if you've started today on, a, um, on the TLD for the first time, you can do your violet at three months on ART. If they known patient on ART, you're going to do a violet at that booking visit, as I've said. And if the violet is LDL, you can do your next violet delivery. You're going to hear more and more about this violet at delivery. If the viral load is more than 50, then we're going to repeat within four to six weeks. And the reason why the six weeks is there is going to be going to coordinate it with the antenatal clinic. So say it's 20 weeks and the next visit is the 26 week visit as per bank plus, then you will do the viral load at the 26 week visit, but you want to do them very quickly. Um, and of course, your big focus is trying to figure out why the viral load is high, figuring out the adherence. And if the viral load is still over 50, you're going to continue to try and address the adherence issues. And then you will repeat your viral load again three months after that, um, or if it's after 28 weeks at delivery. The focus here is, is that our focus is now not about keep on doing viral loads because the majority of these patients, the issue is not resistance. The issue is the patient's not taking their treatment. And so your focus is going to be on how to help that mommy engage in treatment. There's a couple of scenarios where you might get concerned about an unsuppressed viral load in terms of resistance um, on patients on TLD. And therefore, we need to know on which patients are we going to genotype who is continuously failing on their TLD during pregnancy. So these are just the definition for biological failure. And this is anybody who's been on TLD for more than two years, who's had more two or more viral loads, more than 1,000 after the two years, um, and whose adherence is more than 80%. Um, and we, we've introduced TLD exactly three years ago now, just over three years that we actually have had TLD available in the public sector. Um, and I haven't seen anybody like this yet. So most of our patients do very well on TLD and actually to have been failing for two, three years solidly would be quite an achievement on your one tablet. But certainly before you're going to consider a genotype, you're going to discuss with an expert. And there's some very lovely um, little leaflets and uh, helpful tools in the vertical transmission guidelines on adherence, key adherences messages, um, which I'm not going to be covering here. Yeah, that gives us a little bit of an idea in terms of just managing HIV and pregnancy and it's actually become extraordinarily simple um, over the last few years. The next big issue is TB. And one of our, our worry with TB is, is that that's still in terms of um, prenatal mortality in our moms, mo maternal mortality in our mama, mommies is that respiratory infections is still one of the three big killers and TB a significant proportion of that. So we are very, very sensitive around finding and, and managing to screen for TB. So that's why we've got the gene expert at baseline now. All patients are sick, sick patients um, that are unwell need to have a full TB workup. So if you're not sure what's going on, you need to make sure, have I checked like we talked earlier about whether there's TB. We're obviously going to do our symptom screening at every single visit, and this is at the bank visit. So in the antenatal clinic, in the maternity healthcare record, that um, screening needs to happen. And if our mommy is asymptomatic and gene expert negative and there's no contraindications, we're going to start INH prophylaxis. So this is a change. So in the previous guideline, they brought this CD4-350 threshold um, because of a very, very small risk of INH in the third trimester. So there's a slight increase of hyperbilirubinemias and things in the baby. Um, but they've re-looked at the evidence and there's still more benefit than risk than putting the mommies on, on INH. So we're putting all pregnant women on their ARVs um, on INH, and that's 300 milligrams per day for the 12 months, um, as well as pyridoxin 25 milligrams. And that's for usually for our newly diagnosed, newly started women on TLD. The third thing we need to talk about, and we're going to spend quite a bit of time on this because it's not been well covered in the guidelines in the past, is around syphilis and pregnancy. 
Um, and the reason why there's a, a huge focus on that is because of some rather alarming statistics. So the prevalence of syphilis in 2019 in the, big, in the survey that they done at that stage was 2.6%. That's quite a high, 2.6 out of every, almost three out of every 100 women um, had a positive syphilis screen. And the big worry is that there's been an uptick in terms of syphilis prevalence. So the prevalence of syphilis has increased by 30% between 2015 and 2019. And as a result of that, we've also been seeing more congenital syphilis. So our screening is pretty good um, in terms of first antenatal visits. So we're pretty good at picking up moms. There's a good 96.4% of our moms get, get screened at the first antenatal visit, but screening after that has not um, necessarily been that good. And the worry is that there's extreme adverse, both pregnancy outcomes, um, but also outcomes for the baby in those seropositive untreated pregnant women. 80% of them are going to run into some sort of trouble. Um, and so there's a big focus now about how do we diagnose them. So there was a study done um, on congenital syphilis in KZN where they looked at 52 cases of congenital syphilis. Um, and they found that 75% of those would have been preventable if we were testing them and, and treating immediately. Um, and if we were able to test them more frequently. So the two big changes that's come in is there is available, and I checked, we don't have them at CMH. We'll talk at the end on whether they're available at the clinics. They're supposed to be um, available, a rapid detective detecting kit for, um, uh, for syphilis um, so that you can test and treat in the clinic where the patient is. And the other big changes is that we now want every time you test for HIV, so you've got your antenatal visit test for HIV, you're also going to do RPRs. So we're going to be doing RPRs throughout the pregnancy. So just a little bit of a reminder so we can understand what we're looking at when we're looking at the results. There are two major tests that we do. This rapid test that we're talking about is also what we call a treponemal test or a specific syphilis test. Um, and this test goes after about a month, that test, that's a green, thick green line goes positive, and that's going to stay positive pretty much for life. So that's an indication um, that you've had syphilis at some point. To be able to know if it's an active infection, um, there's the RPR, not quite as specific. You can get false positive RPRs, which is why we like to combine the two tests. And you can see it's got sort of a low... Uh, titer um, in that first, in the primary syphilis, and then secondary syphilis, you actually have an increase of titer. And if you treat it uh, successfully, your RPR should be negative um, two years after infection, if you're nice and fully treated. And if you're untreated, that RPR sort of slowly settles down, but unfortunately, you can eventually still develop tertiary syphilis. So we really want to pick up our pregnant woman that might be sitting in the secondary syphilis early early latent phase and might not have symptoms when they're presenting. Um, so when we look at syphilis screening, we want to now align it with the HIV testing. So we're going to do a baseline um, test. We're going to do it at all the Bank Plus visits, just like we're doing with the HIV. Very important, when the mommy comes in for labor, you're going to do the, the syphilis test at labor, and then it really makes sense to have the rapid test. It doesn't, uh, yeah, so now you're doing, it doesn't help you pick up these issues um, two days later. Whenever there's a new uterine death, we have to test the, the mom as well. Um, and of course, any time when the mom is symptomatic. Um, and the kind of symptoms we're looking for, these are for your, as your painless sort of shallow ulcers that you might see with primary syphilis or your condylomata lata, which looks like almost like flat warts and might be getting mistaken for warts. Um, and then your secondary syphilis where you have this rash, um, spotty rash on the body. And especially if it's on the palms and soles, that's very specific. So there up at the top, there's what these two fancy new little tests look like. And what's quite exciting is there's also a dual HIV syphilis rapid test. So one drop of blood on one little thing, and it will test you both your HIV and the, uh, and the TPHA, so the treponemal specific test. And that'll be amazing to have in our antenatal clinics, because then you'll just do them at every antenatal visit. So the rapid syphilis test, um, remember, is the treponemal test, so it will remain positive for life. So if you use it at the first visit and it's positive, it doesn't help to do it at the other visits. So it's only useful to screen your negative patient repeatedly to see if they might have picked up syphilis at some point. Um, and you still want to confirm that TPHA test then with an RPR test and just to see if it's active infection. Um, and that RPR test will have to be done at the NHLS and those titers will change according to the disease progression. 
So for our, um, there's a couple of algorithms in the, in the guideline in terms of depending on what you have available. If you have the syphilis rapid test available, also remember that's the TPHA test. What you can do is you see the mommy, the rapid test is positive, and then you can give your first dose of penicillin right there and then. And then they recommend, <clears throat> if we'll remember. So you send then, you give your band pen and you send um, an RPR to the NHLS. And then you ask them that if the RPR titer is four or one or less, so this is a reactive RPR titer, but it's got a low titer, that they must please do a specific syphilis test on the same sample. And we can chat, as far as I know, they automatically do TPHAs, um, but you want to make sure that they confirm whether this is an active infection. Now the patient comes back a week later. Remember, they've had their first Ben pen. If the RPR now test comes back negative and the TPHA is negative, then, okay, good, that was a false alarm, no syphilis, and we don't have to continue um, with the Ben pen, but we're still going to test for syphilis at every visit. If the RPR is negative and the TPHA is positive, it means they've had an infection sometime in the past, which was successfully treated. There's no syphilis in the system at the moment, and you're going to go back to your regular testing. Um, but if the RPR is reactive, and then um, that patient is syphilis positive. You don't even need that TPHA um, if it's got proper reactivity and you're going to treat that patient. Now, we might not have the, um, the rapid tests. And if you don't have the rapid test, then you'll be doing the RPR test. So it's a little bit the other way around. So you would take a blood test. Um, at the moment, this is now on all our pregnant women. So the, these are all asymptomatic women. You don't know who might or might not have. So you're not giving them any treatment yet. You send your RPR test. Um, if they are, and you, are, you put a note on there that they must please, if there's a reactive RPR, they must please do the TPHA. Then the patient's going to return in one week. If the titer is reactive, um, but it's four and one, so it's a low titer, but the TPHA is negative, then that actually is not syphilis. So we're not worried about a low titer. That's probably a false, false positive because that TPHA is negative. If the titer is low or less, but the TPHA is positive, um, then that's a reactive, um, or, uh, a reactive RPR. And to be on the safe side, we will be treating all of those patients. And if there's a high titer, it doesn't matter what the TPHA, well, it doesn't, well, you won't necessarily, you, you didn't need the TPHA, the TPHA would be positive, but if they've got a titer of eight over one or more, then you're going to be treating. Okay, I know this is very academic. It's great, so what do we do? So very important, we're still using our BenPen 2.4 million unit stat IMI. It's still once a week for three weeks, just like we're used to doing. Um, and very important, BenPen is our only real option. And the reason for this is, is that it covers not only the, but it's the only way to prevent congenital syphilis in the baby. Um, so doxycycline is not an option in these scenarios, unfortunately. You want to repeat that RPR titer in three months to make sure that it's actually worked. And if the mom misses more than 14 days, so say she comes today and then she misses the next two weeks, um, then you actually have to consider them untreated and give the course from scratch. So say they're allergic to penicillin and this needs to be proper allergy, not just a bit of a rash. Um, they actually talk in the guidelines about being referred to the hospital for penicillin desensitization because it's so important to get the penicillin on board for the sake of the baby. And of course, remember all good practices with STIs, treat the partner and, and look for other, other STIs. So you're going to do that RPR three months after completion of treatment. So how do we now interpret that event, right? And what you're looking for is a fourfold drop in that RPR titer. So ideally, if the titer was one in 32 and it drops to one in eight, it means great. Even though the titer is still reactive, we have successfully treated that patient. So it is normal for the titer to not go completely back to negative. So that's where people get confused because quite often you, know, you get a titer back and it might be a one in four or lower. So you still have a reactive titer and that reactive titer can stay very low for, for quite a low time, for as much as two years. Um, as long as we've seen a proper drop, um, we are not concerned, um, but we can keep an eye on if the titer goes up, that would be a concern and would be being retreated as, um, as syphilis. So if your client is currently obviously under treatment for syphilis, then there's no point in retesting them for syphilis at this point. That hopefully makes sense. Trace and treat your partners, and yet it'll be very useful to have the rapid 
rapid test. So that if a partner comes in, we can simply do the, the rapid test. If the patient actually has symptoms of syphilis, they actually only need the one injection. And in these scenarios with the partners, because we don't have a baby on board or a pregnancy on board, we can um, use doxycycline, 100 milligrams for 14 days. And those that are asymptomatic, again, you can do that rapid test. If they're asymptomatic, you might want to confirm your rapid test with a confirmatory test. And then you're going to do your Ben pen for the three weeks. Um, or you can use doxycycline for 30 days. And that's the only reason you would use doxycycline is for allergy or if for some reason you don't have Ben pen available. Great. Oh, you're also with me. This is heavy going. Okay. Hepatitis B. So hepatitis B, um, there's a very good guideline out on hepatitis B, which I'm not going to be covering today and will be worthwhile looking at for our HIV, for our HIV negative patients. In our, in our in patients who's got hepatitis B serum antigen positive, if they also have HIV, actually all our problems are solved because the tenofovir and 3TC and the TLD is going to cover both the mom and is an excellent prevention method for the baby. So it will bring down the HPV virus viral load and um, is, your, is your best option. What gets challenging is if you've got a mommy who might have renal dysfunction with HIV and hepatitis B. And so the, if the GFR is under 50 of that creatinine is over 85, then you cannot use tenofovir. And there you definitely need to get an expert to start looking carefully to see um, what the best options is going to be in terms of cover for that baby. What gets more complicated is our HIV negative and hepatitis B virus babies and um, uh, mommies. Um, and those, I think you would need to actually get um, one of your uh, experts involved and even chat with the infectious disease um, experts. Uh, in short, there is a whole way where you're trying to establish how high the risk is of hepatitis B. And you're going to look at doing things like the hepatitis B E antigen and the hepatitis B viral load. And there's a whole algorithm on how you would use that result to decide which of your HIV negative mommies you're actually going to give um, something like uh, Truvada as a cover for, um, for the hepatitis B. During pregnancy, uh, this might be very well advisable, but we still need to get to a point. I don't think there's enough confidence on the, in sort of the average uh, medical officer to manage these patients. So I think we just need to keep our experts involved. Um, and I haven't covered it here. Very important, if you do have a mommy who's hepatitis B um, positive, even if mommy is on TLD, she needs to get hepatitis B vaccine and immunoglobulin. I'll cover that in detail a little bit later. Um, and so you need to make sure they need to go to a facility where this is actually available. And we'll chat at the end to check whether we've actually got it, um, for example, here at, at CMH. And then the additional care is the stuff we know. Um, in the top corner there, there's a whole two page on fathers, which is quite lovely in the guideline. I'm not going to cover it here. Uh, just remember our pup smears. Just notice with nutrition, our cutoff for nutrition is a BMI of 23, um, not 18. We're obviously going to talk about infant feeding. We'll talk about breastfeeding later, but you already want to prime your mom now. Um, and there's a huge emphasis on checking what's happening with mental health in our mommies. And they've got a, a nice sort of modified PHQ there. Um, and how you screen for mental health issues in your pregnant woman at each of your um, sort of ad booking and at least once every trimester. And very important during the postnatal period to look for possible signs of depression and risk of self-harm in your mommies. There's also quite a nice focus in the transmission guidelines on adolescents, who is a complicated group with a lot more um, factors to take into account to get them safely through pregnancy. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail here, um, but I think it's important to look at how we pre almost provide special, um, extra and additional care for our teenage mothers. Great. So that was the antenatal period. And we're now going to look at what happens now when the mommy comes into our delivery room. Um, and we want to try and, and remember, as I said, delivery is your highest risk. This is the time, even in your mom that is completely virally suppressed, we don't always know what's happening with viral load in the actual genital tissues. Um, there's a lot of fluids mixing, and we actually want to, to, make, to make a difference. So very important, every single woman that comes in the delivery room, if she's HIV negative, must be tested for HIV. So pick there's provider-initiated counseling and test testing. 
Um, and if you don't know, or for some reason you only have one rapid scale test and it's indeterminate or there's discrepant results, or you're going to just treat that mom as HIV positive and that baby is high risk until you've got a clear answer. Um, all pregnant women that's on art, and this has been introduced recently, um, and this is going to have a massive impact on how we're going to manage our babies, they all get a viral load on arrival. So we want to know before they've had their baby, before they delivered that baby, what was the viral load at that moment in time? So it doesn't matter if they had a viral load a month back or two weeks back when they were here for their 38-week visit. We want to know what was happening with the viral load today. If they are HIV positive and they're not on ART, um, then we go, our current um, treatment for that day is you give them TLD stat plus a dose of nevirapine stat. That's a very good way of getting your viral load down very quickly. Um, you're obviously going to initiate their ARVs. Well, you've just given them TLD and they'll continue their TLD on the next day and all the counseling and support that goes with it. So when we look at the viral load after delivery, and I'm now just looking at the mom, we're going to talk about the infant in a lot of detail in terms of what we're going to do with that viral load. But we're going to bring the mom and the baby back, ideally between three and six days. There needs to be an appointment made wherever they're going to come back, either to your own facility or to the clinic. If that viral load is LDL, then the viral load is going to be done every six months throughout breastfeeding. And if they're not breastfeeding, then you'll go back to the, the normal annual reading. But if the viral load was not LDL, a delivery from the mom's point of view, you're obviously going to do your ABCD and your um, enhanced adherence counseling, and then you're going to repeat your viral load in four to six weeks um, if they are breastfeeding, um, and if not breastfeeding, you're three months. So you want to really, really get on top of that viral load very, very quickly. This is still the same from what we've always done. We want to try and minimize the amount of um, trauma to the delivery so, and avoid any unnecessary episiotomies, assisted deliveries, avoid rupture of membranes, avoid excessive suffering, suctioning of the infant. If this is a cesarean section, remember to have your antibiotics on board. Um, and very important, the exclusive breastfeeding is an important part of, of, of this. When we discharge our mommy from the labor ward, uh, remember we need to talk about contraception and very important, we need to give them, we're going to give them a three to six days appointment, but we're going to give them two months of ARVs in the hand, um, and the baby's already going to get their six weeks infant prophylaxis. So a little bit that we don't completely trust, and we don't want to have the risk that the mom doesn't come back for that three to six day visit because she now has to go back to her home in the trans sky because that's where granny is or whatever. So we want to make sure that the mom's got enough medicines in the hand um, when she leaves. We might need to give them an actual appointment at a place for when they're going to follow up within the first six, three to six days. And if they're going, if you're transferring them out on ARVs with an R transfer letter. Um, and the aim is now for the next two years is that that mommy and baby pair ha has to be seen always together. So all their visits, all the EPI visits for the baby, all the postnatal visits for the mom, all the follow-up visits for the HIV, all the follow-up visits for their uh, prophylaxis all needs to happen at the same time in the same room. Um, and this integration is, is absolutely key. So now after the, the birth, after mom's now left your, your unit um, and she was HIV negative, we still want to be very vigorous in terms of testing. So we've obviously tested the HIV test, remember, on the mommy at at on arrival, but we want to do another test at the 10 weeks visit because maybe she was actually in the window period when we tested her at delivery. And um, then she'll be tested at her six months visit. Um, and if she's breastfeeding, we're going to do HIV testing every three months. Because uh, again, if trying to pick up if there's a very high viral load um, as needed. And please, if they're HIV negative um, and they're breastfeeding, make sure they are also on pre exposure prophylaxis. So we've mentioned we'll do a viral load on all HIV positive mothers at six months and every six months during breastfeeding. Great. Now we get to the baby. And actually, it's partly become a little bit simpler. We had very complicated um, guidelines for HIV exposed infants. Um, and what's happening now is that, that we are looking at really being able to define our higher risk babies. So we've already become quite good in the last our last guideline and the WHO guidelines was all looking at using the last viral load before delivery to identify the high risk baby. And we actually were picking up 94% of higher of high risk babies by doing that. 
Um, but we want to simplify the decision. And if you actually know what the viral load was at the time of delivery, that's the, that's the way to 100% pick up all the babies that is going to be high risk. So the biggest thing, there's two major things that's changed to help us now really get that 100% cover of all high risk babies. And the first thing is our threshold for defining risk is a viral load of over 50 not a viral load of over a thousand because we don't know what was happening in the genital tissues at the time. So any viral load over a 50 would be a high risk baby. Um, and then the second important thing is this thing that we are going to make a decision on the delivery viral load on whether this is going to be a high risk baby. And so until we know what that viral load is, we're going to we're going to treat that baby as a as a higher risk baby. So that means all babies after delivery um, is going to be treated as higher risk until we until we know. So we call this universal dual prophylaxis. Um, so in the in the previous guidelines, only the babies who were higher risk would get AZT nevirapine, and all the other babies would go home just on nevirapine. Now all the babies are going home on AZT and nevirapine. And then we're going to make a decision at the three to six day postnatal visit. So when the baby is born, you're going to do your HIV PCR at birth and your HIV exposed babies. And they're going to get that AZT and nevirapine. Remember, the AZT is a twice daily dosing. The nevirapine is once daily. And you have to use the appropriate dosing chart for that particular baby. You're going to give them that three to six day appointment. Um, and then just to note, there are separate... Um, Dosing charts for premature babies, um, for example. So um, double check that you're using the right chart to give your dosing. Now the babe, mom and baby comes back at the three to six day visit. And now we can look at that viral load that was done at delivery to make a decision on what's going to happen. If the viral load of delivery was low risk, we can go, great, this was a low risk baby. I can stop the AZT um, and I'm going to give my nevirapine for six weeks. Ah. Okay, it doesn't matter whether the mom's breastfeeding or not because the mom's viral load is LDL. It means there's no risk of transmission during breastfeeding. And I'm just giving six weeks nevirapine to cover any possible virus that might have gotten through during delivery, right? If the viral load is more than 50 um, and the mommy is breastfeeding, that's immediately a higher risk baby. And so we're going to continue with that AZT twice a day for six weeks as a post-exposure prophylaxis. And that mommy is going to get nevirapine for at least 12 weeks or until that viral load is, is LDL. So if the viral load is not less than 50, we'll continue with that nevirapine. If the viral load is more than 50 and the mom's not breastfeeding, that's a higher risk baby. Remember at delivery, there was virus there. So we're going to continue the AZT BD for six weeks but she only needs nevirapine for six weeks. So we're just giving the post-exposure prophylaxis to cover the, the delivery and we don't need to give extra um, longer before because she's not breastfeeding. Okay, everybody with us. In the abandoned infant, so that's sometimes a struggle when you might have a baby that comes and we don't know who the mom is and we therefore don't know if the baby's been exposed. And what we've done is we've become even a little bit more paranoid and we're basically going to treat that infant as a high risk HIV exposed infant. That's what we're going to do. We're going to do that and we're not going to make any assumptions. We're still going to do an HIV PCR on the baby and we can do an HIV rapid test, which is useful. If it's positive, then we know the mom did have HIV, but if it's negative, it can be false negative. It doesn't exclude the fact that the mom might have had HIV and therefore we don't want to use that to not give prophylaxis. So all of these babies will get nevirapine for six weeks and the AZT for six weeks. And then obviously you're going to follow that baby up to check what that PCR results is doing. Breastfed babies, um, we have to, during breastfeeding, remember we're going to test our mommy regularly for, um, for, HI, for HIV. Um, and if the mom's on art, we're going to do that viral load every six months if the viral load was LDL to check if she's, if she's still okay. And what you want to do is you want to identify high-risk breastfed babies. And there's basically three. So if you've got a baby who was HIV negative, the mom was HIV negative, and now the mom's breastfeeding and she's HIV positive, alarm bells, very high risk to that baby. Or the mom was an art and now the viral load has gone over 50, or a mom who is positive and for some reason is not, not taking her ARVs. Any baby who comes in like that, so this could be any time, baby might be two months old, four months old, six months old, eight months old, doesn't matter, mom's breastfeeding. In those scenarios, you will immediately do an HIV PCR on the baby, 
you will restart that AZT BD for six weeks. So you're giving it as a post-exposure prophylaxis in case the baby got in some HIV virus. And then you're going to keep that baby on a virapine until you get that viral load suppressed, sorted, and um, while they're being breastfed. Our recommendations for breastfeeding is now very clear. We used to have this recommendations if you were HIV and uh, uh, uh. exclusive breastfeeding is recommended whether you're HIV negative or HIV positive. And after second or six months, you can start introducing solids, but we recommend keeping the breast going until two years or longer. Um, and that is, well, just one of the best quality foods that you could add in, add in for your baby. There's a, actually something called the DOH supplementation scheme. I'm not sure if we have formula feed available at the moment. There are specific criteria when you're allowed to use formula. And probably the ones that's the most important is if you've got a mom who's on TLD2 and she's failing on that. So she's been consistently failing on that. Um, so there might be resistance or if she's on a third line regimen and she's failing or she's got a high viral load on third line regimen. So these are people on TLD or third line with high viral loads. Our worry is that the mom's going to give the baby a resistant virus and the nevirapine is not going to cover it. So um, if the mother has died um, or the infant has been abandoned, then obviously we will need to make a plan for that baby. And then there's specific individual circumstances. So say the mom's got a medical condition and she can't breastfeed, for example. Um, and then the recommendation is the government is supposed to be able to provide 12 months of formula feed. And I know this is always a worry because you don't want to start formula feed and then run out. Um, but we need to be able to make sure that we've got that available. And then once the baby's over 12 months, they don't need formula feed. So that's also an important message. Otherwise, you get mom spending a fortune of money trying to keep formula feeding going. Um, and pasteurized full cream milk is, is, is great for that. So in terms of um, HIV testing for the HIV exposed infant, this hasn't changed. So we're still doing that birth HIV PCR at 10 weeks because that's the, the EPI visit. Um, and it's four weeks after we've stopped the nevirapine usually. Um, and then we'll do a PCR at six months for all HIV exposed um, infants. And if you're not sure if the baby's been HIV, so say you've got a mom who's not refusing to test or you don't know what the status of the mom is, then you might even do a rapid on the baby to see if they might have been ex um, uh, exposed. Very important is that our universal 18 month, I'm not sure if this is happening, we're supposed to test all babies at 18 months, regardless of what the exposure history is. So just as a routine screening, all babies at 18 months will get an HIV test, and that will help us pick up the odd one where we might not be getting clear histories. Um, once a baby has stopped breastfeeding, six weeks later, you want to do one again. And of course, any baby who's unwell, you're going to check that. And that is just how our confirmatory tests are working. So if they're less than 18 months, you can confirm with a PCR. You can also confirm with a viral load, either or, depending on what you have available. Between 18 months and two years, we can use our rapid to diagnose. But if it is positive, you have to confirm with a PCR. And then if they're more than two years, they can go on to the two rapids like we do with our adults. Sometimes you might find that at birth, and this is more your complication of a baby who is now maybe six or 10 weeks old and you have an indeterminate PCR result. Because remember, being on a virapine might mess with your result. So in those babies, you want to do an HIV PCR and HIV viral load urgently. Um, and if that's negative and the viral load is negative, great, then we can relax. But if you get anything that's positive or indeterminate or there's a bit of viral load, then we're going to be treating that baby as HIV positive. Unfortunately, you sometimes can't tell. Um, sometimes you get very confusing results and you can't tell while the baby is still on the virapine. And you're going to have to discuss that with an expert. So don't yourself decide, oh, well, let's stop treatment and see what the test does then. Um, rather get an expert involved to help you figure that out. Cool. Great. So let's talk about syphilis. Um, and this becomes important as I've mentioned, we're seeing a lot more congenital syphilis now. And so if you've got a mom who's had confirmed or suspected syphilis, you've got to watch out for those sick babies. So they might be thrombocytopenic, they might be anemic, they might have respiratory distress, they might have meningitis. Um, and most babies with congenital syphilis actually die before they're born. So this is a, a very, a very serious um, complication. And although most of them present in the first two years of life, you can also get congenital syphilis that presents later in life. They go into like a latent, a latent phase. So we need to investigate those babies. And probably the important thing is to remember, if possible, to send a center. 
that was very appropriate <laughs> crying baby okay so um you're going to send your placenta for histology and if there's symptoms like petechiae or jaundice you're going to do a full blood counts and liver functions um, if you're able to do a cranial ultrasound, if you are getting more better and better with ultrasounds available now, a lot of the maternities have ultrasounds to check if the baby's got any bleeds or infarcts. We no longer need to do x-rays or CSF, so you don't have to LP the baby because it's not going to actually change your management. Your focus is going to be on just getting them onto treatment. And all of these babies need to be admitted. I'm not going to cover this treatment in detail because that gets happening in the hospitals but very important it is a notifiable condition they're going to need 10 days of intravenous or intramuscular um, ben, ben pen um, and if the baby misses more than a day then the whole 10 days has to be repeated when you have a baby who's been treated and is out of hospital they need a proper neurodevelopmental screen at 20 weeks um, after uh, corrected gestational age and again that we're going to check that rpr at three months to make sure they have been properly treated what we might see more often is an asymptomatic exposed newborn so now you've got a baby the baby looks fine but when you look back at the mom the mom had a positive rpr and maybe she wasn't treated at all or she wasn't treated properly so this might even be a mom where you do a, a, a rapid test on delivery and you see oh my goodness it's positive um, or you might have somebody who's not had their full three dosages, for example. Or if the last dose they had was less than 30 days before delivery, we will consider that an exposed infant. And those babies we're going to treat with a single dose of Benpen, 50,000 units per kilograms IMI. So this is not an IVI um, collection. And that's we need to make sure that, that those babies get covered for those early and late congenital syphilis. We are getting there. We are getting there. We're almost there. So hepatitis B exposed infant. Uh, so these are the babies where the mom had hepatitis B serum antigen positive. Remember, we said they need to be at a place where they can get both the first dose of the vaccine and a hepatitis B immunoglobulin as soon as possible after delivery, preferably within 24 hours. And then you're going to continue with your hep B immunizations as per the EPI schedule. So they're still going to have the six, 10, six weeks, 10 weeks, 14 weeks, and then a booster at 18 months of age. Very important is to diagnose whether the baby actually got infected. We want to do that hepatitis B serum antigen as well as the serum antibody at nine months of age. So you got to wait about one or two months after the last vaccine dose. And obviously, um, if the serum antigen is positive, the baby has infection. If it's negative, but the antibody is positive, then we know that, great, the vaccine worked and the baby's safe. But if the baby is serum antigen negative and um, antibody negative, then we need to give another vaccine today and repeat in a month's time. So it just means that the immunity hasn't picked up. So um, lastly, I think we are going to talk about the newborn exposing, exposed to TB. Um, and very important also, you want to look for active TB in every single baby that gets born. Um, and if you do see any signs of TB, do not give BCG. And if you've got a baby who's been exposed, then you don't give CCG. So what do we mean by exposure? So the challenge is that sometimes your moms might've been diagnosed with TB early in pregnancy. And so you wanna try and figure out what is the potential that the baby might've been exposed in the last two months before they were born. So if the mom has been on TB treatment for less than two months, for example, or if the mom's on TB treatment, but her symptoms are not improving, so she's still coughing a lot, or maybe you've got a recent smear, you've done a sputum smear at seven weeks and that sputum smear was still positive. So if you've got any evidence that the mom might still be infectious in these last two months, we would consider that an exposed TB baby. We don't give the BCG. Um, and if so, and they're asymptomatic, we're gonna give TPT. If the mom has got drug resistant TB, there's a new TB guideline that's go out, just discuss with an expert on which, depending on the mom's um, uh, DRTB results will depend on what treatment she's going to give. If the baby's got drug sensitive TB, this is quite interesting. They differentiate the kind of TPT you can give depending on the ARVs the baby is on. So there's a very nice new um, TPT uh, uh, option that's come out, which is a combination of rifapentin and INH, but you don't want to give rifapentin to a baby's on avirapine, dolitegavir, or lopinavir, ritonavir, which pretty much covers all of them. So your babies who are on ARVs, um, you're going to give the six months of INH like we've always done. 
Um, but if your baby is HIV negative, but have been exposed to TB and is not on any ARVs, not HIV exposed, um, and if you've got three RH available, then that's a once weekly for three months, which is very lovely. Only give you a BCG once they've completed their I, the INH because the INH kills the BCG vaccine, basically. So your BCG won't take. So that's why we wait with the BCG until they've finished their six months of TPT. Just a lot, uh, quick one on, on Bactrim. So we used to always give HIV exposed babies Bactrim. And actually, there's been some recent studies that have shown that there's no benefit and there is potential harm. Um, or this, the, the risk of harm is higher than the risk of and the possible benefit by giving Bactrim. So the focus is now more on preventing HIV infection. And if the baby got infected, to pick it up nice and early. All our HIV infected babies will still get Bactrim as always, but we're no longer doing Bactrim for just HIV exposed infants. So one of the things I'm going to just ask you to go and look at in your guidelines and um, as our last final couple of slides is on um, being able to use data to provide better care and the very much the focus on integrated care. So we really want to um, have the possibility to be able to keep in bird's eye on what's happening in the patients that's under antenatal care. Um, and so I would recommend they, the, the links are also in the guideline. If you go to the NICD um, self-service portal, you can go to something called M&E dashboards and you can register your, under your MP number or under your SANAC number for, um, for data management. And you want to be able to record um, all of your information as you normally do. And then what you can do is you're gonna use this to be able to keep an eye on what's happening on your program. And what you can request is you can request email reports to be sent to you. So you can request something called the HIV viral load RFA report, which it will actually send you all the viral loads done on your antenatal patients. So all the viral loads done in the last week on your mommies who, for example, has delivered. So this is an amazing way as a manager for you to keep an eye. And one of the things that we're going to use is something called EGK codes. So EGK codes is called electronic gatekeeping codes. Most of us don't like them because they always make trouble if we don't fill them in. But actually you're gonna use EGK codes as a way to um, actually help you monitor your own programs. So the gatekeeping code is a way to help us prevent sample rejection. So at the moment in the NHLS, I think if you do an HIV viral load less than three months apart, they're going to reject it. So if you're going to do viral loads now, often during, um, for example, at delivery, you don't want that sample to be automatically kicked out. So you want to be able to let the lab know that this is a pregnant woman or a woman with delivery. But because you're putting that code in, you're now going to be able to trace yourself all the patients that you've done viral loads on just on the antenatal program, which is very lovely. So this is what it looks like. There are two codes that you need to know. The one is called, it's, the one is C hash PMTCT. And every time you do a viral load on somebody that's pregnant, you're going to use that code and you're going to put it in that little EGK approval code um, on that NHLS form, that little line there. And then if it's during labor, you're going to put C hash delivery. Very important to remember this because otherwise you're not going to get those, those viral loads might get rejected, which will be a pain when you see your mom at three months. But that also means that you can now go and search on reports using those codes. And as a program, you can monitor um, all of your patients like that. So lastly, we want to really start integrating. We want to integrate the tools that we are using. Um, we want to be aware of all the amazing tools we have in terms of, for example, our CCMDD and repeat programs. But very important is that all of our schedules, and they've, they've mapped them out in the guideline, is that all of your visits, your EPI visits for the baby, your antenatal visits, all of them must be aligned with what's happening with your ARVs, what's happening with your contraception, what's happening with your pre-exposure prophylaxis, what's happening with your TB treatment. And we do not want moms to be moving around between different services um, for, different, for different parts of the program. So great, there's our last summary. We are now wanting increased access for everybody to get their TLDs, either TLD1 or TLD2. We've tightened our definition of higher risk. So everybody gets dual prophylaxis on discharge and we're getting very vigorous with our syphilis screening and management to um, reduce congenital syphilis in our moms and babies. Thank you very much, everybody. I know that was a marath marathon session um, and I'm going to encourage you to continue looking in your guidelines. Um, just a reminder for everybody that's on the 
on the online to please put your names and your registration numbers um, in the chat. That's how we know that you've actually attended for CPD purposes and also for us to see who was here. Um, and the same with YouTube, please add them into the chat there if you're watching us live on YouTube at the moment. Uh, if you do have any questions, please put your hand up online. I'm going to start opening up just for questions and comments um, into the wider group here. Yes, I know it's quite late. So if there's any particular comments. Um, yeah, I've got Dr. Mohammed is just coming to the fore. All right, thank you, Dr. Miller. That is an amazing presentation. I'll give you an extra round of applause for that. <laughs> um, very uh, off the topic, I see we don't do group B testing, uh, group B strep testing in um, state. Will that ever come to fruition closer? Because I don't know what's the, uh, uh, the complication rates of, you know, respiratory infections in young neonates from that. The, so that's one. The second question is, um, and so you talked about art literacy. How, where's the push for antenatal literacy more in a group setting? And is that going to be the next level for, because there's, you know, anecdotally, I see throughout the Eastern Cape, young mothers, mothers in general, or, you know, pregnant women don't know too much about the process of it. Uh, and then finally, the the partner treatment seems to be a challenging issue, especially with the slip code notification. And uh, you know, you 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 keep treating people, but then you find out the partner has been treated. So how do we increase the awareness of that? Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed. Yes, um, the strip. I don't know. I'll, I'll make that your homework. Uh, it's not available. Is the short answer whether we should in terms of evidence. Um, uh, yeah, I don't. Yeah, so you can see if there is any data in South African setting. Certainly, it's not something I see in that we see in practice. Um, in terms of groups, antenatal groups. So yes, there's a huge focus. There's an amazing. There's a lot of focus in the guideline in terms of education of mommies and, and some great tools in terms of education for mommies. The groups, I agree, and there's very good evidence, especially around breastfeeding that if you have groups in the community for antenatal care for your moms, that there's a much higher uptake of breastfeeding after. Um, so that's one of the things that we've actually got very good evidence on, that if you actually want to introduce behaviors like that, um, the peer pressure in the group is very, very important. So being able to create opportunities for that, I agree with you, very important. Um, and I think quite often as healthcare workers, we actually have the resources. You know, you've got all these women who's gathering in your group, you know, You've got an antenatal clinic. They're all there. So actually, it's up to us to we can create impromptu possibilities to, to do discussions. And I'm sure some facilities that's already happening. If you uh, you get some very inspired midwives, it'll be doing some great stuff out there. Um, yeah, partner treat. Oof, that's a whole topic in its own right. <laughs> okay, yeah. So um, Dr. Adonais is going to comment on that. The, the the simple answer to the simple answer to that is um, we are not doing so well in terms of partner treatment. If you look at most of the um, sexually transmitted infection, uh, sexually transmitted disease guidelines over the years, of emphasize part, partner notification. But again, it depends on where context matters. You need to know the practice of your population. Your you know, practice population, often they're not. They, they, that's, that aspect of communication is often not the, the best option. In some other settings, they do facility linked kind of uh, tracing, you know, um, which again requires a lot more resources. I know Kuban strategy, you actually provide a list of your, you know, sexual encounters in the previous three months. And they, with their contact details, are facility deliver the treatment. We do not have such uh, kind of. Uh, uh, I don't think the appetite in the guideline has gone out to that extent because that will be indirect notification, which again is you know disclosure issues, ethics. So there are a lot more that needs to come into that space to for us to be able to practice that. But again, in the literature for me, you know, it's good for your learning to familiarize yourself with all the other strategies of dealing with the partners. 
you know, that does not directly depend on the patient in terms of uh, treatment. But in South African setting, we expect that a patient will open the conversation and bring the pain of partner to care. But we, again, we know that is not the best strategy in terms of improving care. And again, with regard to syphilis, and that's where the issue of reinfection comes in. And the quantitative value of RPR, again, there are different types of non-specific or uh, non-trepodemic uh, uh, validum testing, you know, VDRL is one of them, uh, Wasama reaction is one of them, you know, and to within the reaction, there are quite a number, but in terms of follow-up, whichever test that's been used at baseline is what you must use, because if you use different options, the values are different, even in the same, at the same, from the same blood sample. So one in four, uh, you expect four fold reduction or four fold increase to confirm uh, uh, reinfection in the category. And if the patient has been successfully treated uh, with penicillin, you expect uh, one for uh, four fold drop, you know, within three to six months and the, you know, uh, post treatment. Um, I think in terms of interpretation, we just need to be careful. In the early phase, especially in the first three weeks, RPR may be negative and TPSA will be positive. And that's where the concept of the reverse algorithm testing, which NHLS has adopted, actually is more able to pick most of these patients in terms of diagnosis. So we just need to be mindful of that. But I think for the, our colleagues in the PACs, when they see those results and they are not sure, they should rather call for guidance. Um, thanks. I also say there's a question about the hepatitis B vaccination schedule. So in a baby who's born to a mom with hepatitis B um, serum antigen positive, you would actually you would give obviously the vaccination on the day and then you will just give the vaccination schedule as usual. So the normal 610. So the, the schedule doesn't change. So they actually end up having one extra dose at birth and then the normal hep B vaccination schedule. I also see we've got somebody here from obstetrics. Yeah. Would you like to comment and tell us a little bit about do you, um, I assume you're all doing viral loads at delivery. Do you, have you seen the, the, the rapid syphilis tests by any chance? Okay. Putting you on the spot. Please introduce yourself. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Mbeu from Obstetrics. I actually haven't seen these uh, rapid yeah. a, um, a syphilis tests mm -hmm. as yet, mm -hmm. you know, but I know that we do have a good uh, PMTCT program being run there. Uh, by our nurses. And yeah. the hepatitis B serum, and do we have hepatitis vaccine and um, immunoglobulin in the delivery? No, we don't have that in the delivery unit. In fact, that's the homework for me to check if okay. we have those things. Okay. Um, yes. Yes, yes. So great. So that's something we can follow up and make sure that we have that available. Is anybody here from the Nantia Chamber MOU um, or from one of the other, uh, Frey, even or? one of our other uh, delivery units that can tell us about what's happening in terms of access to some of these tools like the hepatitis B immunoglobulin um, or even the rapid test. Has anybody seen any of these rapid tests? I, I, I think it's important to, to since South Africa introduced, since South Africa introduced hepatitis B vaccination, we will need to look at the data around, you know, especially in our practice set in terms of prevalence now, yes. you know, because often they're not, facilities don't keep this kind of medications until they see a case and they start running, we start running around for treatment, for the appropriate uh, treatment. But we do know for hepatitis B vaccination, it is often available in the wellness clinics for um, pre-exposure treatment for star head care workers. So that's probably the easiest place to get it in the hospital, but the immunoglobulin, we may need to run around because it's often not stuck. So. Um, Mama Tandazo, I see you've un unmuted. Did you yes. want to speak? Yes, I wanted to talk about the rapid uh, syphilis. We do have at uh, primary health care. So all our clinics, they start uh, with the rapid then if it is positive, then they will take blood to the lab. So we are using it. And then the second part about uh, hepatitis is that uh, the guideline uh, requires a patient who is negative to be immune, uh, get immunization uh, or vaccination. Uh, so that is the problem. We do not have that at PHC according to EML. It is not a primary health care uh, uh, 
drug that should be available, the monovalent hepatitis B vaccine. So that is the one that we are trying. Uh, we, we actually have written a memo so that it can be escalated to provincial PTC and maybe from there it will be escalated to national PTC or something. But at the moment, we haven't started with that vaccination, which we were supposed to have started from April, but we haven't been able to because it is not uh, within our, uh, within PHC EML. Thank you very much. That's a very helpful contribution. I'm sure Dr. Jenny Nash, she's the chair for the provincial PTC, and I'm sure she'll pick that up um, as something that we can look at take forward. Because actually, it doesn't even need to be in the EML. There could be a down referral agreement for, for, for um, antenatal clinics to be able to have access to the vaccination. I mean, we're getting into small babies. It's not exactly, it's more of a financial issue. It's not a risk issue. Thank you very much. Any last comments or questions from our online participants? Uh, we all need to get back to our busy day in clinic. Thank you very much, everybody, um, for joining. This will also be um, available on the Wusu Family Medicine and Rural Health Department YouTube channel, um, and I will be sending it around. So please also uh, pass forward it to your colleagues who weren't able to join us this morning. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a lovely day.